Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Today, we've chosen an episode in honor of the holiday, A Christmas Carol from the Campbell Playhouse, starring Lionel Barrymore as Scrooge and Orson Welles as narrator. A Christmas Carol is based on the 1843 novella by Charles Dickens, originally titled A Christmas Carol in Prose, being a ghost story of Christmas. The story's emphasis on generosity, family, and the power of redemption helped to shape the way Victorians celebrated Christmas and still influences our holiday traditions today. Although A Christmas Carol has been adapted countless times in almost every media, many credit Lionel Barrymore's annual radio performances for popularizing Dickens' story with American audiences. Today, Barrymore is best remembered for his portrayal of another evil miser, Mr. Potter, in the film It's a Wonderful Life. But for radio listeners of the mid-20th century, his name was synonymous with Ebenezer Scrooge. Barrymore played the role on radio from 1934 to 1953, missing only two performances, one in 1936 when his wife passed away and one in 1938 due to illness. Only five of Barrymore's performances survive today, the earliest of which is today's 1939 production from the Campbell Playhouse. After Orson Welles' infamous War of the Worlds broadcast, the Mercury Theater on the Air gained enough notoriety to attract a sponsor. In December of 1938, the Mercury Theater on the Air became the Campbell Playhouse. Just as before, Orson Welles and his Mercury Players adapted classic and modern literature for radio, ranging from Victor Hugo's Les Miserables to the first-ever adaptation of Daphne du Maurier's 1938 novel, Rebecca. The only real differences between the old and the new program was the congenial baritone of future Quiet Police star Ernest Chappell, who pleasantly extolled the virtues of Campbell's soup. The Campbell Playhouse first presented A Christmas Carol in 1938, with Orson Welles taking over the role of Scrooge in Barrymore's absence. It's clear by Welles' introduction to the 1939 version that he is very pleased to have Barrymore back. Subsequent performances of Barrymore's A Christmas Carol were heard on the Rudy Valley Show, The Mayor of the Town, Wrigley's Christmas Festival, and the Hallmark Playhouse. Lionel Barrymore died November 15th, 1954, a little over a month before what would have been his 19th performance of the Dickens classic. And now, make yourself a festive drink, turn on your holiday lights, and let's listen to A Christmas Carol from the Campbell Playhouse, originally broadcast Christmas Eve, 1939. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music and listen to the voices. The makers of Campbell Soups present the Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. clearly a number of ways in which a Christmas carol could be introduced. Myself, I am most struck by the happy fortune that enables us on this Christmas Eve to present Mr. Lionel Barrymore, the best-loved actor of our time, in the world's best-loved Christmas story, A Christmas Carol. When Charles Dickens presented this little story to the world almost a hundred years ago, it found an instant response in the hearts of people everywhere who saw in it, their favorite fictional chronicle of what Christmas is and what Christmas means to all the simple people of the earth. From the day of its first printing, families have been innumerable in which there has remained unbroken the tradition that the reading of a Christmas carol was an item indispensable to a proper observance of the most important of days. 
It is the American way, as we know, to establish traditions quickly where popular instinct and sentiment pronounce them sound. And so it is that today, actually only the fifth anniversary of Mr. Lionel Barrymore's first playing of the part of Ebenezer Scrooge for the Campbell Playhouse, there is, I think, in all America nothing more eagerly awaited, more firmly rooted in the hearts of the radio family that numbers millions than this yearly performance of A Christmas Carol. A Christmas Carol, as Charles Dickens wrote it, has by common consent long been a classic. Mr. Lionel Barrymore's appearance in it is rapidly becoming one. And now, just before A Christmas Carol, Ernest Chappell has a special Christmas greeting from the makers of Campbell's Soups. Mr. Chappell? Thank you, Orson Welles. As the old year draws toward its close, we of Campbell's feel a bond of warmth and gratitude toward each of you, our friends. For you see, in homes everywhere throughout the land, Campbell's soups have been welcomed. Day by day and week by week, you have placed confidence in us and in the foods we make. And there isn't anything we appreciate more deeply than the fact that so many of you have elected to let Campbell's make your soups for you. And so when Christmas comes, we look about to find some way to show our appreciation, some Christmas present by which to say thank you. The gift we chose five Christmases ago and have chosen each year since has become a part of Christmas to many and many a family. It has become a Christmas custom, as Mr. Wells said, to gather around the radio to hear and to enjoy a Christmas carol. And since it is Christmas Eve, we hope, too, that the younger members of the family are permitted to stay up and listen before dreams and visit of Santa. We get a great deal of pleasure planning and preparing this Christmas gift, and now it's ready. Off come the wrappings, off come the tags that say, please do not open till Christmas. Out comes the card. To you, from Campbell's. And here is the gift itself. Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it. And Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. Scrooge and Marley were partners for I don't know how many years. Ah, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone with Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. And once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house, a grim, cheerless place if ever there was one. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clerk, Bob Cratchit, who in a cold and dismal little cell beyond worked at his ledgers. 20, 21, 22. Merry gentlemen, let nothing you despair. 23, 26, 29. 9 carry 2. Christmas day. 11, 13, 17, 17. Bob Cratchit. Uh, yes, Mr. Scrooge. Stop that infernal chatter walling. Yes, sir. 9, 15, 17, 29. Carry 1. 9, 15, 17, 29. Singing their idiotic Christmas carols in my very door. Go on, get away from my door. Go somewhere else and bellow your blasted carols or I'll give you in charge. Sorry, Governor. It's an old custom at Christmas time, you know. Yes, and I don't want any of your old customs. Take your fellow fools and go away. Christmas. Blah. Right, sir. Merry Christmas anyway, sir. Ah. Now you get that letter from Higgins and Blackthorn, Cratchit. And then I want you to finish posting this ledger. And after that, you can pop over to Fothergill's and tell Lee for him, Fothergill, you've come after the 17 shillings and sixpence he's owed me since Michaelmas. 
And tell him I shall have a constable over there if he doesn't pay up at once. Well, Mr. Fothergill's wife has been ill, sir. Oh, what do I care about his wife? I want my 17 and 6. I, I just thought it being Christmas, sir. Christmas, Christmas. You mention that word to me once more, Bob Cratchit, and I'll... Merry Christmas, Uncle. Merry Christmas, Bob. Merry Christmas, Mr. Fred. God save you, Uncle. Uh, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle? Now I'm sure you don't mean that. I mean just that. Exactly that. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you? You're poor enough. Well, what right have you to be dismal about Christmas, Uncle? You're rich enough. Yeah. Now, Uncle, don't be cross. Well, what else can I be when I live in such a world of fools? What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? Merry Christmas. A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle. Now, nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it, Uncle. Well, let me leave it alone, then. What do you want? A Christmas gift, I've no doubt. I came to wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle. A Merry Christmas. Much good may Christmas do you. <laughs> Much good it ever has done you. There are many things from which I derived good, by which I have not profited materially, I dare say, Uncle. Christmas among the rest. But I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. God bless Christmas. Hurrah! Let me hear another sound out of you there, Bob Cratchit, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Yes. As to you, nephew, I wonder you don't go into Parliament. You talk enough nonsense. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry you feel that way. Well, I've tried. A Merry Christmas to you, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year, too. Ah, humbug. And a Merry Christmas to you, Bob, and the missus, and a tiny Jill. Thank you, Mr. Craig. Same to you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day, Bob. Nonsense. Twaddle. Flummery. The talking of Christmas and not two sixpences to jingle together in his trousers' pocket. Hey, hey, you there, Bob Cratchit. Come here. What are you doing there? I was only putting a bit more coal in the fire, Mr. Scrooge. Seeing it's so cold in there, sir. You put that coal back into the scuttle. A fire. A fire, indeed. I can tell you, if you use coal at that rate, you and I will soon be parting company, Bob Cratchit. You understand that? There's many a young fellow like your situation, you know. I'm sorry, sir. My fingers were getting a little stiff with the cold. Well, then put on your mittens. Someone at the door. Go on, see who it is. Oh, yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. This is the firm of Scrooge and Marley. Yes, sir. I should like to see the head of the firm, if I may. Oh, very good, sir. What is it? A gentleman to see you, Mr. Scrooge. Huh? Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley's been dead these seven years tonight. I'm Scrooge. Well, now, Mr. Scrooge, at this season of the year, it's only fitting that we who are more fortunate should raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. You may not believe it, sir, but many thousands are now in want of common necessities. Right. And hundreds of thousands are in want of the simplest comforts. Uh, are there no prisons? Well, there are plenty of prisons, sir. And the workhouses, they're still in operation, I trust? I wish I could say they are not, but they are, sir. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor, then? Both very busy, sir. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I was afraid from what you said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. No, sir, all these institutions that you mention are flourishing. But it's nevertheless true that some additional provision for the poor and the destitute must be made. Ah. A few of us upon change are endeavoring to raise such a fund, you see. And uh, what shall I put you down for? Nothing. Oh, I see. You wish to be anonymous, sir. I wish to be let alone. I don't make merry myself at Christmas time. And I can't afford to help make a lot of idle people merry. I help to support the establishments that take care of the poor. They cost enough. Let those who are badly off go there. Many can't go there, sir. 
And many would rather die. Then my advice to them is to do so and decrease the surplus population. Besides, I have only your word for it that all this is so. It's the truth, Mr. Scrooge. Well, so be it, then. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, sir. I quite understand, Mr. Scrooge. Good Thank afternoon. You. Show this gentleman out. Yes, sir. Uh, this way, sir, please. Sir, I couldn't help overhearing. I should like to contribute threepence. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. It isn't much, but it's all I can afford. But there are others in worse situation than I. You're a generous fellow. I wish I might say so of your employer. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas. Yes, sir. Close the door. Yes, sir. Twenty-four, thirty-one, one and carry three. New scarlet tippet for Tiny Tim. New comb for Martha. Thirty-three, three and carry three. A hair ribbon for Belinda. Four, seven, twelve, fifteen. Roger. Yes, sir. It's too late to have you go to Father Gill's. He'll be closed up for Christmas like these other fools. We may as well close up the place now. Yes, sir. It is getting a little dark. Mm. Hard to see the figures. I, I suppose you'll want the entire day tomorrow. If it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair, either. But I suppose I can't do anything about it. <laughs> if I was to stop half a crown of your wages, you'd think yourself very ill-used, I'll be bound. Well, sir, I... Yeah, but you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. Once a year. Once a year, indeed. A fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose there's no good talking. You must have the whole day. Well, see that you're here all the earlier the next morning. You understand? Oh, I will, sir. I will indeed. Good night, sir, and Merry Christmas. Ah. Merry Christmas! Ah. The office was closed in a twinkling, and Bob Cratchit, with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no greatcoat, went down a slide on Cornhill 20 times in honor of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play with his family at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge, on the other hand, took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and spent the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went to his dismal house. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, had to grope with his hands through the fog and the frost to find the door. Scrooge walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room? Bedroom? Lumber room? All as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet. Close the door. He locked himself in. He double-locked himself in. And took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap. And sat down before the fire to take his gruel. <coughs> Marley. Marley? Marley! I could have sworn I saw... Ah! Humbug. Marley's been dead these seven years. Humbug. All humbug. What I need is a good night. What? What's that? Someone's in the plane, sir. But the door's locked and double locked. Something's... It's, it's coming. Some... Something is it? It's coming closer. Outside my door. Ah, stop. I won't believe it. It's humbug still. Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> Marley. <laughs> oh, no. What do you want with me? 
I want much of you, Ebenezer. Who are you? Ask me who I was. <laughs> You're very particular for a ghost. All right, then. Who were you? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley. But you're dead. You died seven years ago. Seven years ago this very night. Oh, you are a ghost, then. What's wrong, Ebenezer? Don't you believe in me? I do not. You doubt your senses, Ebenezer? Yes, yes. Because a little thing affects them. Slight disorder in the stomach makes them cheats. You can't be a ghost. You, you may be an undigested bit of beef, or a blot of mustard, or a, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> yeah, there may be more gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. Ah, humbug, I tell you. Humbug. <laughs> I do believe in you. You are a ghost, Jacob. Thank you. Well, why, you, why do you walk the earth, Jacob? Why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide to witness what it cannot share but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. Well, tell me, Jacob, did... What is that chain you wear around you? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard by my own free will. Is its pattern strange to you, Ebenezer? Cash boxes, keys, and padlocks, and ledges, and... Yours was as heavy and as long as this seven years ago. And you have labored on it since, Ebenezer. Oh, Jacob. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. Comfort I have none to give. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger. Weary journeys lie before me. You travel fast? Yes, Ebenezer. On the wings of the wind. Uh, seven years dead and traveling all the time? Seven years, Ebenezer. Seven years of remorse. Ebenezer, do you know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunities misused? But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, benevolence, they were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Oh, Jacob, Jacob, don't take on so now. Jacob. Listen to me, Ebenezer. I listen to you, Jacob. Go on, Jacob, now. Speak to me, but don't be so flowery. Ebenezer, I am here to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. Do you hear that, Ebenezer? Yes, Jacob. Yes, you, you always were a good friend to me, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob. But, but go on, go on, go on, go on. How shall I escape? Oh, I'm afraid, Jacob. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the only chance and hope, Jacob? It is your only chance and hope. Well, then I think I'd rather not. Without their visit, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Ebenezer, look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. And remember, when the bell tolls one, Look for the first spirit. Molly. Jacob Molly. Scrooge awoke. He was lying on his bed fully dressed. 
Suddenly the curtains of his bed were drawn aside and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them as close to it as I am now to you. And I am standing in the spirit at your elbow. It was a strange figure, like a child. Yet not so like a child as like an old man. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age. And yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Ebenezer Scrooge. (gasps) Who's that? Ebenezer Scrooge, I have come for you. Oh, you... uh... Uh, Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold me? I am that spirit. (laughs) What are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. (laughs) Long past? No, your past. But what do you want of me? What brings you here to haunt me? Your welfare, Ebenezer Scrooge. Rise and walk with me. Oh, no, 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 not, not out of the window. I can't do that. I'll fall down. I'm not a spirit. I'm mortal, and I'll fall. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Come, follow me. Where are we? What's become of the city? (laughs) There's snow upon the ground. Where are we? These are the shadows of the things that have been. You recognize this countryside? Oh, Oh. I know every inch of it. Every rock, every tree. And that bleak building over there? Oh, that building. (laughs) I was a boy there. Yes, I went to school in that horrible place. Do you recollect that path? (laughs) I could walk it blindfold. Strange you should forget it so many years. Come, let us go closer. Look through the window into that cold, barren room. What do you see, Ebenezer Scrooge? I see a boy. A solitary child, neglected by his family, alone. Yes, yes, I see. I know that boy. Oh, oh, I was so lonely. Poor boy. Your lip is trembling, Scrooge. And what is that on your cheek? It's nothing. Nothing at all. I wish I... Ah, it's too late now. What's the matter? Nothing, nothing. The waits came to my door singing Christmas carols last night, and there was a boy like that among them. A poor, pale, thin little boy in a ragged coat. I should like to have given him something, that's all. Is that all? Come, Ebenezer Scrooge. Let us see another Christmas. Do you know this place, Ebenezer Scrooge? You know it? Know it? This is the counting house where I was apprenticed. Listen. <laughs> it's my old master, bless his heart. Old Fezziwig. My master, alive again. And hosted one of his Christmas parties. Listen to him. Thread the needle and back to your places. <laughs> and there's Dick Wilkins. Poor Dick. Dear, dear, dear. Yes, and look, there's Mrs. Fezziwig herself looking younger than any of them. And the tables all loaded with roast and cider and mince pie and beer. Oh, what a jolly time we used to have. That carefree young man with a light heart and a gay smile. Do you recognize him? Yes, 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 merciful heaven. <clears throat> How happy I was then. A small matter for old Fezziwig to make those silly folk so full of joy. Small matter? Small indeed. Isn't it? He has spent only a few pounds of your mortal money. 
Is that so much that he deserves praise? Ah, it's not that. It's not that, spirit. Old Fezziwig has the power to make us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or heavy. His power lies in words and looks and in things so tiny that it's impossible to count them up. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost her. <sighs> what is the matter? Oh, nothing, nothing at all, spirit. Something, I think. No, no. Speak. Well, only it's just that I should like to be able to say a word or two to my club. Bob Cratchit. That's all. My time grows short, and we have yet another journey to make. Where now? Come. This is our last visit to the past, Ebenezer. Here, in this little room, with a fair young girl by your side. Do you recognize yourself, Ebenezer? <gasps> no, 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 no. Spare me this. You're step. older now, a man in the prime of life. Your face has begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. Your eyes are greedy. The eager, restless eyes of a miser. No, no, please. She knows it, too. That girl by your side. There are tears in her eyes. That is little Ebenezer to you. Very little. I know that. Belle, have I changed toward you? When we were engaged, we were both poor. Was it better then? Better to be poor? Better at least to be happy. You're changed. You were another man then. I was a boy. Do you blame me because I've grown wiser? Have I ever tried to break our engagement? In words, no. Never. In what then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In everything that made my love of any value in your sight. So I release you from your promise. Bill! Oh, at first it may cause you pain to lose me. A very brief pain. But soon it will be dim. Like a half-remembered dream. An unprofitable dream. And you will be glad to be awake from such a dream. May you be happy in the life you have chosen, Ebenezer. For the love of him you once were. It's enough. Show me no more. Take me home. These were shadows of the things that have been. That they are what they are. Do not blame me. No. No more. No more. One shadow more. Come. Do you see this man, Ebenezer Scrooge? This man might have been you. And the woman beside him, your wife. And that girl... That girl might have been your daughter, Ebenezer Scrooge. She might have called you father. She might have been a springtime in the haggard winter of your life. Spirit, let me go. Show me no more. Listen now while they speak, Ebenezer. Bell, I saw an old friend of yours today. Who was it? Yes. How can I? It... Oh, I know. Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window. It wasn't shuttered. And there was a candle inside, so I couldn't help seeing him. His partner, Marley, lies at the point of death, I hear. And there Scrooge sat, all alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, spirit, I can't bear any more. Leave me. Haunt me no more. Take me back. Take me back. <laughs> You are listening to the Campbell Playhouse, bringing you tonight the fifth annual presentation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, produced by Orson Welles and starring Lionel Barrymore as Scrooge. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. When we bear them feel that Sage and Monarch forth they went 
For they went together Through the rude winds while lament And the bitter weather And now back to the Campbell Playhouse And our fifth annual presentation of A Christmas Carol A Christmas present from the makers of Campbell's Suits On the stroke of one, Scrooge awakened suddenly and sat him bolt upright in his own bed. You remember the words of Marley's ghost and wondered from which direction the second specter would appear. At that moment, nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing. And consequently, when no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. Then, as he sat in his bed, he became aware gradually of a great blaze of ruddy light that seemed to shine upon him from the adjoining room. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his own sitting room, no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as had never been known in Scrooge's time or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up to shed its light on Scrooge, as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in, Ebenezer Scrooge, and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You've never seen the like of me before. You're, you're different from the other spirit. You're tall, almost a giant. And that great torch you carry. Its light falls into the homes of rich and poor alike. Spirit, take me where you will. Last time I went against my will and learned a lesson which is working now. If you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe, Ebenezer Scrooge. Touch my robe. Where have you brought me, Spirit? An humble dwelling, an humble street. <laughs> it's miserable enough. Yet there is happiness there. Who, who are these people? Who's that woman and the children? These are the family of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. See his wife, dressed in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, laying the table for their Christmas dinner. And there, assisting her, is her daughter Belinda, and the young man with a fork in the stuffing. That's Master Peter Cratchit, and the two little Cratchits. Listen, Scrooge. Here's Martha, Mother. Martha! 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 Bless your heart alive, Martha, my dear. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Mother. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. How late you are, my dear. Oh, we had a deal of work to finish up last night, and we had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind so long as you're here now. Sit you down before the fire and have a warm. Lord bless you. Where's Father? He's been to church with Tiny Tim. They'll be along directly. How is Tiny Tim, Mother? Any better at all? Sometimes I think he is. And sometimes I think, oh, dear God, if anything should happen to Tiny Tim. Mother... You mustn't even Merry think Christmas, of such a thing. Here they are. Oh, Tiny Tim. Merry Christmas, everybody. Martha, welcome, my dear. Merry Christmas, Father. And Tim. Oh, Merry Tim. Christmas, Martha. Oh, Jim, you darling. Let me take you. Oh, Father, I'm so glad to be home. And we're so glad to have you, Martha. And how did little Tim behave in church, Bob? Oh, as good as gold and better. Oh. I like church, Mother. Oh, they sang the nicest songs. I hope people saw me there. Saw you there? And why, Tim? Well, don't you see? Because I'm lame. And if they saw my crutch, it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas who it was made lame beggars walk and blind men see. 
Oh, bless you, my son. Are we ready to eat, Mother? Come oh, on, let's eat. Yes, children, we're, we're all ready. ready. Here we go. Come take your places now. Oh, and I'll oh, wait your turn. There's plenty of stuffing and dressing and plum pudding for all of you. Martha, you take care of Tiny Tim yes, and see that he eats plenty. He must get strong and well. Now, just sit down, sit down, everyone. And now, my dears, shall we say grace? Spirit, Our Father, who are tell you? me. If Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner carefully preserved. Oh, no, no. No, no, kind spirit. Say he'll be spared. Say he'll live. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, Ebenezer, the child will die. Amen. 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 And now, my dear, oh, no, with such a dinner, a toast. A Merry Christmas to us all, and God bless us. God bless us, Christmas. everyone. And now to Mr. Scrooge. I'll give you a toast to Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, who pays you all a 15 shillings a week. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for oh, it. Oh, my dear, the children, Christmas Day. Yes, it should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Bob. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. And I say, God bless him too, Mother, and everyone. Oh. God bless you, Sam. nothing of high mark in all this. They were not a handsome family, these Cratchits. They were not well-dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty and had known very likely the insides of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another and contented with the time. And when at last they faded, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. Many calls Scrooge made that night with a ghost of Christmas present. Down among the miners they went to labor in the bowels of the earth, and out to sea among the sailors at their watch. Dark, ghostly figures in their several stations. Much they saw, and far they went. And many places they visited but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds and they were cheerful. On foreign lands and they were close at home. By poverty and it was rich. In almshouse, hospital and jail, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, the spirit left his blessing. It was a long night. If it was only a night, and it was strange, too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. My life on this globe is very brief, Ebenezer. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Hark, the hour has come. Oh, no, no, not yet, not yet. There are still more things I wish to learn. These you will learn from still another spirit. Still another spirit, Ebenezer. Scrooge looked about him for the ghost that had vanished, and he found himself once more in his bed in his dressing gown and his nightcap on his head. He'd heard the clock strike, and then he remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley. And lifting up his eyes, beheld... The third spirit. A solemn phantom. Shrouded in black. Draped and hooded. Coming towards him slowly and silently like a mist along the ground. Ah, I know you. You, 
You are the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You will show me the shadows of things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Answer me, spirit. Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any specter I have seen. Yet I know your purpose is to do me good, as I hope to live to be another man from what I was. Lead on. Lead on. Night's waning fast. Time's precious. to Bob Cratchit's home. But it's not the same. Why, why is it so quiet? So very quiet here. <laughs> Mother. Oh, Mother, please. Oh, my son. My little son. Tiny Tim. I loved him so. Oh, Mother, dear, you mustn't. It's almost time for Father to be home. Don't let him see you crying. Yes. Yes, Mother. He's late tonight. He walks slower than he used to. And yet I've known him to walk very fast indeed with tiny Tim on his shoulder. So have I, Mother. But he was light to carry. And his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble at all. Bob. Good evening, my dear. You're late, Bob. Yes, I'm sorry, my dear. I went to the churchyard today. I wish you could have gone with me. It would have done your heart good to see how sweet and green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him. Yes, I promised Tiny Tim we'd walk there on a Sunday. Father, dear. It's God's will, Bob. I'm trying to understand it, my dear. My son. My little son, Tiny Tim. And I loved him so. Oh, that's cruel. Cruel. Spirit. Can't you give me one ray of hope that I may change all that? The tiny Tim may live? taking me now. Here, on a common street spirit? What is there for me to learn here? Who are those men? I don't know much about it. Either way, I only know he's dead. Where did he die? Last night, I believe. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral for Palmer life. I don't know anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided. <laughs> hey, you know, come to think of it, I'll wait I was his best friend. What? We used to nod to each other when we met in the street. <laughs> Spirit, tell me, who is this man that died? Is there no one to mourn the poor creature? No one to follow him to the grave? Perhaps they'll give him a green grave at least, like poor Tiny Tim. Perhaps... Where are we now? Merciful heaven, a churchyard. Overrun by grass and weeds. Choked with too much burying. Desolate. Lonely. Crumbling graves. Spirit. Before I draw nearer to that gravestone, answer me one question. Are, are these shadows of things that will be... Or, or are they shadows of things that may be only? Huh? Will, will you not speak to me, spirit? What is that grave to which you point? Ah, no, it's, uh -huh. There's writing on that stone. The name on the gravestone is... Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, no, no, Spirit. No, 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 no. Hear me. I'm not the man I was. Why show me this if I'm past all hope? 
tell me that I can change these dreadful shadows you've shown me by an altered life. I'll honor Christmas in my heart, and I, I'll try to keep it all the year. I'll live in the past, the present, and the future, and I'll not shut out the lessons that they teach. Tell me, Spirit, oh, go on, tell me. Tell me that I can sponge away the writing on that stone, Spirit. I beg you, Spirit. I beg you. I promise. I promise on my knees. I promise. I promise. I'll. I. Let love and joy come oh, to you. you and it's my own bed, boy. Oh, I'm home. In my own bed. In my own room. And the sun. The sun's shining. It's clear. It's bright. No fog. What a beautiful day. Oh, glorious. Glorious. The boy. Oh, boy. Yes, sir? What? What's the day? What's that, sir? Well, what day is it, my fine fella? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. <laughs> Christmas Day! Then I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. All in one night. Heaven be praised. How's that, sir? <laughs> Listen, my lad. Uh, do you know where the poultry is in the next street? I should say I do. <laughs> Intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Tell me, do you know if they sold the prize turkey that was hanging in the window? The one as big as me? <laughs> What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, my buck? It's hanging there now, sir. That's wonderful. <laughs> Go around, will you? And tell him to send it to Bob Cratchit and his family on Broad Street. And mind you, they're not to know who paid for it. Go along. Hurry, hurry, my lad. Here, wait a minute. Here's half a crown for your trouble. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And a Merry Christmas. <laughs> and a Merry Christmas to you, my boy. Oh, I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather, as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. Merry Christmas. <laughs> a Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. Woo! Yes, sir. How do you do? I... I beg your pardon? Well, you, sir, aren't you the gentleman who came to my office in regard to that charity? Why, yes, sir. A Merry Christmas to you. Uh, yes, sir. Allow me to ask your pardon, sir. And will you have the goodness to accept... I prefer to whisper this. But... But, Lord, bless me. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you serious? If you please. Now, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. <laughs> Will you do me that favor? Oh, my dear sir, I don't know what to say to such munificence. No, don't say anything, please. Come and see me. Will you, will you come and see me? I will. I will indeed. I <laughs> thank you. I'm much obliged to you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. Merry Christmas. Next morning, Scrooge was early at his office. He went early for a reason. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. At last he came. His hat was off before he opened the door. His comforter, too. He's on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake 9 o'clock. 15 at 21, 6 and carry the 1 and 24 and carry the 2 and 31 and 8 and 9. Hello, and you little Cratchit. Yes, sir. Step this way, Cratchit, if you please. Cratchit, what do you mean by coming in at this time of day? 
Oh, I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are. Yes, yes. I think you are. Oh, it's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. I'll tell you what, my friend. I'll not stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Bob Cratchit, I'm about to raise your salary. Mr. Scrooge, are you quite yourself, sir? No. No, thank heaven. I'm not quite myself. Merry Christmas, Bob. <laughs> Merry Christmas, my good fellow. A merrier Christmas than I've given you in many a year. I shall raise your salary, and we'll see what we can do for Tiny Tim and the rest of your family. Huh? <laughs> hey, we'll discuss it this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Bob, make up fire. Make it up and, and, and buy another coal scuttle before you dart another eye, Bob Cratchit. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. To Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them. His own heart laughed. That was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards, and it was always said of him, that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us, of all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. have just heard our annual presentation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, starring Lionel Barrymore, brought to you by the makers of Campbell Soups. And now, here is Orson Welles. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point in the program, it's my custom, as you know, to present you with a few words of introduction, our guest of the evening. With your consent, I shall dispense with this tonight. To introduce tonight's guest to the Campbell Playhouse audience, or to any American audience, is an extravagant and superfluous procedure. For if ever an actor has won for himself a lasting place in the hearts of his fellow countrymen through years of unsparing and inspiring service, that actor is Lionel Barrymore. Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Oh, thank you, Orson Welles. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, this is the fourth year I've had the pleasure of appearing in the Christmas Carol here on the Campbell Playhouse. And I assure you all, it's a pleasure that never tires. As long as I can remember, this has been one of my favorite stories. When we were children, it was read to us regularly at this time of year, as it is to many millions of children right now. <laughs> and like many of them, I'm sure, the three of us, Ethel, Jack, and I, with the aid of a sheet and some old ironware, made a play of it. As I remember, we had three Scrooges in that production. Uh, who played Tiny Tim? I think we had three Tiny Tims, too. But seriously, I can think of no part that I've enjoyed playing again and again as much as I have the part of that squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner, Ebenezer Scrooge. And I can think of no happier or more suitable choice for the makers of Campbell Soups to offer the people of America as their Christmas present each year than Charles Dickens' well-beloved story, A Christmas Carol. Good night, Orson. Good night, everybody. And a merry, merry Christmas to you all. Good night to you, Mr. Barrymore. Thank you, sir, and a merry Christmas to you. Ladies and gentlemen, next Sunday night, we're happy to announce our version of a great and truly American story by a great American novelist, Come and Get It, by Edna Ferber. 
Against a background of the mighty forests of Miss Ferber's own Wisconsin, it tells a stirring tale of the men and women who live and die in the woods in order that lumber may come down the rivers every spring into the cities of the modern world. Like so many of Miss Ferber's epic romances of American life, it was made from a best-selling novel into a highly successful motion picture. Now we bring it to you on the air. The story of a man and his son and the girl they both loved, Lotta. Lotta, played for us by one of the loveliest and most accomplished of Hollywood's younger dramatic actresses, Miss Frances D. And so until next week, until Come and Get It, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us in the Campbell Playhouse remain as always obediently yours. But just one moment, please, Benny, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, it's the night before Christmas. And all through the Campbell Playhouse, not a creature is stirring that doesn't join Lionel Barrymore in wishing you a merry, merry Christmas. This goes for all of us, from my sponsor, myself, or for all of us, from Don McBain, who runs the machinery in the control room, to Miss Helgren, who types the Campbell Playhouse scripts, a Merry Christmas. From Benny Herman and his band of Merry Melodians, Merry Christmas. From Max Tears, a uh, canary-throated chorister... Christmas, and from Harry Esman and Cliff Thorson and his crew of sound effect technicians, a Merry Christmas. And from Orson Welles and his considerable aggregation of dramatic talent, who include, among others, Mr. Everett Sloan, Mr. Frank Reddick, Mr. Erskine Sanford, Mr. George Kouloris, Mr. Ray Collins, Miss Georgia Backus, Miss B. Benaderet, and many, many others, a Merry Christmas. Far about it, everybody. A Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. That's right. And now, as Tiny Tim says... God bless us, everyone. The makers of Campbell Soups join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us in the Campbell Playhouse again next Sunday evening when we bring you Edna Ferber's Come and Get It with Miss Frances D. as our guest. Meanwhile, if you have enjoyed our fifth annual presentation of A Christmas Carol, won't you tell your grocer so this week when you order Campbell's soups? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and a very Merry Christmas to you all. <laughs> A Christmas Carol from the Campbell Playhouse here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. Hey, happy holidays, gentlemen. Hey. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. How are you guys? Festive. Yeah, considering this is July of 2019. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretending that it's Christmas for all our listeners. No, it's it's a few weeks out. Yeah. We're close, close enough. enough. Yes. Yeah, we got snow here. We're good. Um, it's July. <laughs> right. So it is July. Oh, Minnesota. So yeah, the Mercury Theater on the air, or Campbell Soup on the air. Right. Yeah, it's an unfortunate sponsorship, just because Mercury Theater on the air is so cool. That's such a cool name and title, and the Campbell's Playhouse is just not hey, cool. If Campbell's Soup wants to give us a call, we are the Campbell's Soup Playhouse Podcast. <laughs> You're right. Correct. Mysterious old Campbell Mystery Soup. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I don't care. It's enough. sad when other people sell out. Right. <laughs> I just wish they would have stuck with Campbell's Soup Presents Mercury Theater yeah. on the air instead of just... But anyway, that's nitpicky. <laughs> um, so... Here we go again. I've started 912 of our podcasts with this sentence. It's weird, and it's difficult when you're comparing something this classic. Yeah, sitting down to think, well, let's give some critical thought to Christmas Carol. Seems ridiculous. Yeah, and they didn't do anything unique to make us really have to analyze their take on a Christmas well, Carol. to our ears, yeah. I would say... That's part of its charm, though, yep. knowing it's Orson Welles and that he is an ambitious fella, particularly yep. in this era of his career. Correct. And he 
seems to recognize that this is a damn near perfect story. And yeah. he doesn't try to reinvent it at all. He just presents it in a very straightforward manner. He has a real reverence for the source material. You can tell as he's performing the narrator how much he loves Charles Dickens and the language. Yes. I mean, when he does the line of a, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, oh, yeah. he picks up each word yep. and <laughs> cuddles it before he goes <laughs> to the next one. I mean, he clearly mm -hmm. loves this. And uh, when you combine that kind of confident but conservative approach with talent like he has... Yep. I was Lionel wondering Barrymore. how much this production, not to say this year's production, but the Lionel Barrymore production that it was doing was the first mass media production that Americans heard. So how much of what we think of, like that's boilerplate Dickens' Christmas Carol, mm -hmm. is this? I yeah. would say a lot of it. I mean, as we said in the beginning, this is really what introduced us to this story as an American culture. And I haven't read the original in a couple years, but this seems pretty true to it. It's just condensed. Yeah, yeah. just a few cuts, I think. Right. It's true to the original, but nonetheless, the Lionel Barrymore 19 years of doing this really became the basis for everything from Mickey's Scrooge adventure, whatever it's called, <laughs> to all of it. What I'm curious about, since we don't have all of them existing, is if it changed at all from year to year. If it didn't, I'm going to go back to what you just said about him understanding that it was such a perfect story. It also could be very well, uh, this one I get to phone in. This yep. is easy. Mm -hmm. It's the end of the year. I just give him a Christmas carol. I don't have to do anything creative. I don't have to think. But this is give him a Christmas well, carol. They have to love it. And here's the thing about Orson Welles, though. If everyone loved it, I don't think that means he wouldn't want to change it. Right. He might want to change it all right. <laughs> the all more. more. Because yeah. I did read he left this radio show over creative differences with uh, Campbell's Soup. They let him choose all the novels at first, mm -hmm. and then they started interfering and wanting the adaptations he did to be far more mainstream and mm. nothing controversial. And Orson Welles just said, we'll see you then. So right. I think if he thought this should have been told in a different way or would have been better being told in a different way, he might have I think he would have done it. it. Yeah. So that's why I think that that's why might... I, That's why I think he himself respects it. Because if he doesn't, he has yeah. no problem changing it. <laughs> or again, you know, end of the year, it's like a break for him. Yeah. But I think you're right also that I don't think Orson Welles is the kind of guy that said, ah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to take a few yeah. weeks off. And... You know, he doesn't need to work. He'll walk in 10 minutes beforehand based on the stories you right, read right. about Orson Welles <laughs> and go, actually, let's do this one backwards. Right. <laughs> you're all ducks. We... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Let's just see where it goes. His intro where he's talking about the tradition of families reading this to each other, which is on the same track of me that this... Existed, but not in a mass media sort of way. Really being sort of long for a day. It's like when families would get together and read to each other. <laughs> I mean, now I'd hate that. Yeah. But yeah. to have grown up in that environment and to have that sort of treasured family thing that we get together and yeah. we read the story to each other, that sounds very sweet. My family's Black Friday tradition is half price books. We wait in line to get our $5 gift card when it uh. opens just to be around a hundred other people <laughs> who still read books. <laughs> and then I go home. <laughs> We read Stephen King to each other. <laughs> and for our listeners' knowledge, you know, Joshua and Tim and I and our family spend the holiday of Christmas together. So knowing that, now I can say this. Oh, this year we're reading books to each other. <laughs> <laughs> At each other. At each other. <laughs> At, At the, the same, same time. time. <laughs> Whatever book you got, which for me will be none. Fear and loathing Las Vegas it is. <laughs> hey, look at this coffee table book with pictures. <laughs> Let me just throw this out there. So we're going to do this on stage. And that's important. What? Yeah. <laughs> now you tell me. And it's important that I bring that up for what I'm about to say. So as I'm listening to this, I'm also going through the script and doing a treatment for our live production of this that we're going to adhere to. And there are things that I want to change that aren't in this. And it's mostly transitional and fully related. Uh, there are things that I think could have been added easily to give it some more depth. I... Orson Welles thought it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you change it? I think that there could be some things that can happen, little things that I wrote, that every time Marley talks, the chains should rattle. You can add a little depth to this, but like you can see him moving if you just rattle those chains as he talks. The, the Ghost of Christmas uh, future, even though he does not talk, 
there are things you can do to create a sound. Like that? <laughs> yes, like that. Oh, Orson is kicking himself. <laughs> there are things you can do to create a more ominous atmosphere around that particular spirit. My point being that it seemed mostly to be people singing Christmas carols to be your transitions and all of your uh, uh, depth. And uh, that's fine, but a, yeah. it he was a little much. He also had Bernard Herrmann yeah. doing Correct. music. So yeah. at that point, you're choir. like, I, I'll go ahead and, and, this choir, and let yeah. uh, those guys take center stage. If, I'm going to go out on a, a bow, a Christmas bow. I'm going to go out on a <laughs> Christmas bow here. <laughs> and say that we are not going to have a full orchestra or choir in our live performance. <laughs> but I think that if you don't have all that, I don't think Orson would have used as much of yeah. that choral, mm-hmm. of that choir, and of that orchestral music that was put mm-hmm. in there. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Or that maybe was... Lionel Barrymore was like, will you stop shaking those chains while I'm trying to do my <laughs> lines? <laughs> I just think it was a little heavy on orchestra and choral. Mm-hmm. But the Christmas Day in where is this London? It's, it's seemed... Milwaukee, Eric. Is it Milwaukee? <laughs> I don't know. It just seems like, I don't know. There were other things you could do. Mm-hmm. And parts where it didn't need anything that had people singing outside his window. And I was like, just open the window and yell out in the street, which was another issue I had. Uh, I understand the perspective is that we're standing next to Scrooge, right? Yep. However, the boy is on the street. And granted, he's off mic yelling. Good. But he's talking normal voice. You should be slightly louder yelling down at the boy. And yep. so those things kind of messed with me from a production standpoint. So you imagined he was on, on a much higher floor. A little bit higher, uh, to the point where it needed to be a little louder. Because the boy establishes he's at least a story below. I just think it was a creepy boy peeking in his ground floor window. <laughs> <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> but he's yelling as if he's below. I'll go you one further. Yeah. I'm going to critique the story a little bit. A couple of years ago... Eric thinks he's Orson Welles. <laughs> Tim <laughs> thinks he's Charles Dickens. <laughs> Please, guys, tell me what these masters of art could do better. <laughs> uh... <laughs> well, to be fair, one of my critiques is something that was cut. I, okay. they, uh, adaptations of Christmas Carol often cut Fred out, and I love Fred. Yeah. But I suppose he's the easiest to cut, so I missed him. But a couple of years ago, I directed a Klingon Christmas Carol and noted in this adaptation... The ghosts are largely jerks, more jerk ghosts, which is an <laughs> ongoing theme. Basically, their their intent is, we're going to teach you about Christmas by threatening to kill you. Very Klingon. Yes. <laughs> uh, and the, like the, the real actual role models are Bob and Fred, the people he actually learns positive things from. Right. I don't think the story really addresses how bad the ghosts are is my complaint. <laughs> so this goes back to some of the Foley stuff Eric's talking about, where the emphasis in this is on the redemptive power of Christmas, not approaching it as a frightening ghost story on, in the mm. front half. This production is also interesting, uh, Barrymore's take on Scrooge, in that his, his mood pops up quickly, like when the past comes and shows him, here's your past, like, my past was awesome! <laughs> <laughs> he does the turn in this adaptation really quick, too quick for me. He turns in the middle of the first ghost. He says, ah, you're right. I want to see Cratchit. I want to change everything. Oh, I got two more ghosts to go. But it's in the story, I, I believe, mm-hmm. that he, like, are you crying? Like, yeah, I'm crying. <laughs> Shut up. You're crying. I think, I That's think, a direct quote. <laughs> I, think, I think we've all come to believe, though, through other adaptations that There's a stubbornness to the entire journey until he sees his grave. My problem when it's the grave, then it is merely a threat of death. Yeah. Be (laughs) kind or die. And that isn't a real... Wait, isn't that what religion is? (laughs) (laughs) No, it's the exact opposite of that. But what I like about it is that it is a steady softening of Scrooge's heart. There is a slow burn to his revelation as he goes on, but I think that the seeing his grave is the turning point for me. It's often that way. I, I don't li- like that. You don't I like it? I did like this adaptation in that sense of, <clears throat> he goes to the past and he sees people he used to love, but he still hates everyone he knows now. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. People always look better in your rearview mirror. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to really miss you guys in 20 years. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll be real sad. Oh, I ain't going anywhere. <laughs> but I'm done but, making friends. This is it. You guys are my friends. <laughs> and I'm done. You've settled. I am so settled. It's too much work. Okay. Uh, Got to tell I, them about yourself. And... <laughs> 
confession time, though, I really like Scrooge <laughs> and identify with him a lot. Well, a, but then he changes, yeah. like, why? <laughs> right. Well, I do like that Dickens makes him actually funny. He has yeah. some clever yeah. quips, even though he's being a jerk. But the uh, prison's could, still working? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he raises, I think, some points that uh, in our heart of hearts we find ourselves agreeing with at times. Like, I pay my taxes, you know, or I elected a politician to take care of that. Why should I have to give you any money? Um, and so I think Dickens, as well as Barrymore in his performance, knows that you have to feel something for Scrooge to be invested in his eventual redemption. If he's 100% a monster, you'd be like, I, right. I don't want to see him redeem. I want to see him die slowly and painfully. <laughs> and I think it, a lot of adaptations run into that problem, yeah. that they just make him very unlikable. Yeah. And then a real sharp turn of like, I love everyone, which is weird. Yeah, and here I think you see a potentially appealing character from the beginning, at least in Barrymore's performance, and I think in the original story. Well, you like him because he never wants to stop working. <laughs> and that's why you identify with him. I like him because he hates carolers. Because, <laughs> I mean, there I agree with him. I mean, yeah, I'm going to stand with my door open when it's 20 degrees out while you bellow deck the halls at me. <laughs> See, this is where you and I differ. <laughs> If I would do carolers just once, we never have had them. I've done it. I've gone caroling, but I've never had anybody show up my door and carol. Yeah. And I think that would be lovely. I would you make... You wouldn't answer the door. You said you don't answer the door for people you don't know. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> but if I saw people singing, then it would be my luck. I'd be like, sweet carolers. And I'd finally open my door and they'd stab me. <laughs> take all my stuff. I know what you're getting for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> a carol stabbing. <laughs> Things Bob Newhart might say. <laughs> All right. <laughs> wow. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> I do always wonder what happens the next day because Scrooge's transformation has this ecstatic quality, like a religious conversion or like it is. the first day of a vegan diet. You know, that kind of thing where you're like, I can do this. <laughs> He's broke because he and gave all his money it's away. It's like, you know, a Boxing Day backslide. <laughs> right. This is a reborn story. Yeah, it is a Discovered. redemptive story. It's a Christian story of sorts, no? I think it can be read that way, and it's yes. very compatible with Christian theology, right. very specifically in many, many places. Yeah. Even when he says to the boy, I'll go give him a turkey, but don't tell him who sent anonymous. it. Anonymous. It's yeah. the, you know, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. So yeah, for sure. I just and told a that... joke in my head that I can't say on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of, <laughs> yeah. he wants to get to work early the next day so he can torture Bob for just half a second. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, that's, that's always a weird thing, and they all do it. I'm still angry, and I hate you. And, uh, <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Are you crying? <laughs> right. The gun I brought to work today just about did it today. Uh, I do admire that this adaptation keeps the moment of bitterness from Mrs. Cratchit in it because it balances out the grace being offered by the rest of the family that they're not stupid. Everything Mrs. Cratchit said is true about yes. how they're treated Our by Scrooge. Our child is dying. Yes. <laughs> so right. that, that kind of forgiveness does come at a price. Yep. And they decide to do it anyway. And even she's still like, I'll do it because it's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm leaving you tomorrow. No, it's not. It's implied. <laughs> it's implied. <laughs> So every time, in just about every version of Christmas Carol that I see, when he whispers in the ear of that charity giver, that charity uh, guy who asks for charity. Oh, yeah. That I'll, guy. I'll give you a tuppence. Yeah, in my head, it's like, two dollars. <laughs> my words. <laughs> two dollars. <laughs> I don't even know what dollars are. <laughs> he leans in Back out slowly or I will kill you <laughs> and your entire family. <laughs> See, there are things we could do with Christmas Carol that yeah. make it much more exciting. Take that, Wells. Yeah. Take that, Dickens. Yeah. Yeah. Those guys suck. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a car chase scene. <laughs> See? Uh, I wonder why poor Jacob Marley did not have a selfish friend who would come back from the grave and <laughs> warn him before he had to spend eternity in chains. Yeah, kind right? Of, yeah. I never thought of that. <laughs> Does he get released if he's freezed? Is it like the... Nope. Oh. 
like the devil said, hey, you get this guy to come around. You don't have to live here anymore. Let's pretend that happened. Yeah. And then he's like, just kidding. Because <laughs> I'm the devil. Are you crying? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's vote. <laughs> Joshua. Not worth revisiting. <laughs> you will learn nothing from this. You will learn no lessons. Boy, bring this turkey to that radio program. I don't work all year to waste my time listening to a Christmas carol. <laughs> bah, humbug. No, I... I love this production, of yep. it, and this really cheered me up. Yep. The hope in it just gets under your skin whether you want it to or not, and I think this production is great. Lionel Barrymore is great. Orson Welles as the narrator, like I said, just cherishing every word he speaks, but not hamming it up, but just right for the story. I do not think he hams it up for Dickens. You haven't read Dickens. Dickens he is over the top. I will say he doesn't ham it up for Orson, but man, it's hammed up. I mean, Orson <laughs> is a hammy guy, and this is... Toned down for him, but it's still very Orsony. It's very Orsony. Orsony. It is. <laughs> That's fair. It's second act War of the Worlds ish. <laughs> I had to get it in there. <laughs> it's Christmas. Cut him some slack. <laughs> All right, because it's Christmas. <laughs> Tim? This is a, a, definitely a classic. Not only just the production itself is so phenomenal, it's a production of a story that has obviously proven how good it is and how much it resonates with a bunch of people. But this production in particular, I mean, this Christmas season, there's probably going to be eight productions of A Christmas Carol going on around me at any time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, two on TV, uh, a movie version. Just all, a all troop of actors just following them around town. <laughs> it's <laughs> creepy. Uh, and they all draw directly or indirectly from this production. Yeah, this yearly production. Yeah. It was wonderful to finally listen to this. Uh, it is a huge part of the fabric of the celebration of the holiday. So significant historically, for sure. Really well done. If you're going to traditionally do a Christmas carol in some way, shape, or form, this would be my recommendation. I thought it was beautiful. And as you said at the top in the writing of the intro, uh, you can feel Wells' love of Barrymore. They like each other a lot. And Chapel. They're, yeah. they're all really glad to be there. Yeah. And I will say this before we sign off. Ernest Chapel is just appealing hawking Campbell's suit. <laughs> yeah. Does a great job. Anything else before we throw it over to Tim? Well, before the orchestra starts playing, let's just stop and introduce <laughs> every single person who is involved in this production. It's yeah. just us. But... <laughs> <laughs> right. That seemed strangely canned in a impromptu moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tim, tell them more stuff. <laughs> Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com, home of this podcast. You'll find other episodes there. You can leave comments on them. You can leave a message for us. You can link to our social media pages. Uh, get a hold of us that way. If you would like an episode that you want us to listen to, that's the way to get a hold of us. Uh, and because it's Christmas and you, you're probably all broke, I'm not going to tell you to go to patreon.com slash the morals, but to make a New Year's resolution to do it <laughs> next year and support <laughs> this podcast. You can also go to iTunes and write a review because that is free and we like that too. Uh, you can also go to Facebook and join our discussion group. Uh, it's the end of the year, so we are voting on our best and worst of old time radio featured on this podcast this year. So go join the group and uh, make your voice heard. Oh, and also, if you've forgotten to get a gift for someone, go to our website, ghoulishdelights.com, and click on Threadless and yeah. go get them some Mysterious Old Radio we Listening have Society stuff. all sorts stuff. of ways to take your money. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to see us perform live, we also do live theatrical versions, uh, recreations of old-time radio shows as a theater company. We also do original work. If you'd like to see us live on stage doing that, Go to the mysterious old radio listening society.com and you can see our schedule of events. What's coming up next? Uh, next, in honor of New Year's, we are going to listen to an episode of Quiet Please called Rain on New Year's Eve. Until then, Merry Christmas! Cratchit, what do you mean by coming in at this time of day? Well, oh, I'm very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are. Yes, yes, I think you are. Oh, it's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. I'll tell you what, my friend. I'll not stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Bob Cratchit, I'm about to raise your salary. Are you crying? <laughs>